book that uh, was just mentioned, uh, the book I wrote nearly a couple of years ago now on archaeology, uh, set out to look at the, what I thought would be the background of archaeology, but is in the history of science and, and to some extent also the philosophy of mathematics. That for me at least made reading the archaeology um, kind of make sense. Um, I read the archaeology against that background. Now, um, as I was finishing that book, I already had in mind uh, the question as to what connection might there be between this scientific and uh, even mathematical background in archaeology, and what people are going on to write about later on, in particular work on self and uh, ethical writing. And uh, it's been in my mind since, and in fact one of the reviewers of the book said, shame he didn't go on to talk about the relationship between this and the later writings. <laughs> so it's been in my mind since to, to do this, and um, in, a, in a way what I'm doing today is taking an opportunity to talk to you to try and figure out a little bit what that might look like. Now I'm not actually going to talk about the background, or what I take to be the background of who archaeology applies to philosophy, science, and mathematics, so I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but I will be going back to the archaeology uh, a little bit. So, one question we're talking about today really is the relationship between Foucault's writing in that period in the late 1960s and the writing on the cultivation of the self, the care of the self. That is more specifically the topic of this, this meeting. So that's one question. Um, as I've read more of this later writing, I've read it more carefully, thought about it a little bit, uh, another question has also fixed itself in my mind a little bit, or posed itself to me, and that is really quite how to read it, what does it have to do with these later texts? How do we read them? And um, these two questions for me become linked. That is to say, how do we read the Foucault's writing? And what connection it may have to his writing back in the, the, the archaeology, back in the late 1960s, early 1970s? So that's what I want to, to, uh, to talk about today. And um, because what I'm trying to do, I suppose, here, or trying out, is, a, is a, something of a kind of schematic um, uh, idea. I'm just trying out an idea to see if it fits together. Uh, there will be a kind of, we, we do move through some of the material in, 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 in probably more quickly than it deserves, to be perfectly honest. But what I want to try to do anyway is to set out this kind of structure of reading. You can see resistance 
against constraining powers. Moreover, such resistance is accompanied by a sense that change can always be affected. For all these reasons, and of course for many others, Foucault's writing on itself rightly draws our attention. However, reading this work presents us with something of a problem. To put it very bluntly, what lessons regarding our own condition can we draw from Foucault's work on ancient Greek and Roman thought? And in asking this question, I'm assuming that this work, Foucault's work, uh, can be read as more than a series of interesting exercises in scholarship. It goes without saying that we can always learn from the past and that we do well to let our thinking be both illuminated and challenged by its own history. If Foucault frequently reminds us that the past was a far stranger place than we sometimes carelessly imagine, he also picks out features, uh, features of ancient thought, in this case, that have remained in his view constants, or near constants, in Western history. For example, a relation between purity and truth that I'll discuss in a few minutes' time. Such insights enrich our thinking, but for Foucault, the task of thinking was above all to elaborate a critique of contemporary life. And he attached great importance to the specificity of historical analyses undertaken in the service of such a critique. So I want to suppose that in addition to the more general benefit to be had uh, from engaging with history, Foucault's work on the self in ancient Greek and Roman thought contributes something specific to the elaboration of a critique of contemporary life, or a conception of critique that would be appropriate to our own time now. I want to suppose that such a contribution is historically specific in the sense that there is a reason why it is important for us here now, in late modernity, to pay attention to it. This leads then to the question I want to talk about this morning, which is this. In what way can Foucault's studies of ancient Greek and Roman thought inform the way we think about the self today, and in particular, the way the cultivation of the self is linked to, uh, to critical thinking or to conception of critical thinking? The first step in trying to answer this question, it seems to me, must be to outline what Foucault himself regarded as the key features of the time that we're living through. Obviously, Time allows here allows only the very briefest of uh, outlines, but among the variety of different perspectives uh, that his work presents, uh, one I think stands out. It is the analysis of the problematic role played by the figure of man in the predicament of thought in modernity that he lays out towards the end of the order of things. That predicament, and I would add, his analysis uh, of historical character of the conditions of knowledge that he goes on to present in the archaeology of knowledge. From these works, we can draw both Foucault's uh, diagnosis of a problem facing thought in modernity and the basic features of his response to this problem. A response that takes the form of a new kind of epistemological discourse. One, and this is what I want to propose, one that opens up the space for a new form of critical practice. Although the terms of Foucault's analyses changed over the years following the publication of the Order of Things in the Archaeology of Knowledge, to taking genealogy, power disciplinarity, governmentality, and, and, and more besides, the insights of these earlier texts, I maintain, were not simply left behind. If we are to take Foucault's studies on the cultivation of the self as significant today, and let me be clear that I think we should, then it is important, I think, to read them in the light of this response, this earlier response. That is, as being situated in the space first opened up by his thinking in the late 1960s. So, in this paper, I will outline Foucault's diagnosis briefly outline Foucault's diagnosis of the problematic condition of knowledge and ability. And how the archaeology can be read as opening a space 
escape this condition. Then I'll suggest that it is within this space that Foucault situates both the possibility for a renewal of critique and, in fact, the possibility of a return to thinking about the self or the subject and its relation to truth. As the title of the paper suggests, I see these two possibilities converging, such that the renewal of critique and the cultivation of the self through its relation to truth are mutually supported. So, in the order of things, Foucault shows how knowledge and modernity have been drawn into a dead end. If knowledge is a representation of the world, including human life and society, representation is an activity of the subject and knowledge can only be grounded in an account of the subject as what he represents. At this point, two alternative routes open up. One route leads back to a Kantian form of inquiry into the transcendental conditions of representation and thus of knowledge in the subject itself. And the other route leads from the subject to its external conditions in language, the body, social and economic relations, and so forth. As a result, the attempt to know the subject treats it on the one hand as an empirical being that can be known and experienced, and on the other as the bearer of transcendental conditions for the possibility of knowledge and experience. That is, as what Foucault calls an empirico transcendental doublet. Divided in this way, the figure of man is bound always to elude its own grasp. This, Foucault explains, gave rise to a fluctuating movement between branches of inquiry, while a fixed point on which thought as a whole might rest a firm foundation remained out of reach. <clears throat> At the heart of this difficulty lies the figure of man, the works of the subject and the object of knowledge. Foucault famously suggests that man is a recent invention and one nearing its end, by which he means that it is only in modernity that knowledge has been organised around man in quite this way, and that the various problems he describes had at the time of writing already begun to lead to the exploration of alternatives, such as the turn away from a philosophy of the subject to a philosophy of the concept, as proposed by Jean Caviez and taken up by Georges Combier and others. In this way, the disappearance of man as a knowing subject would open up new approaches to knowledge and truth, and in doing so also, <coughs> new ideas of the self and subjectivity. The archaeology of knowledge can be read as an attempt to give impetus to such approaches, resolutely refusing any appeal to the subject, consciousness, intention, understanding, interpretation, and so forth. Foucault describes how knowledge is composed of statements whose conditions of possibility lie neither at a transcendental level nor in empirical reality. For example, in social or economic conditions, in single identifiable cultural events, inventions, or initiatives. But rather, in conditions of knowledge, rather in relations between other statements, more precisely, in relations between the rules that describe the formation of various components of such statements and their interrelations within discursive formations. By this, I mean that the statements, in which other work is account of knowledge in archaeology, statements involve rules for the formation and use of concepts, the formation of objects, and the deployment of methodologies, and on the side of the subject, for whom can speak them, when, how, and to whom. Production of statements depends on rules in the form of regularity regularities of any part that may be relatively settled or indeed quite new. In the case where they are new, the rules, the regularities, will often crystallise from different discursive formations rather than simply developing those in a single formation and evolving in a single kind of linear style fashion. For example, uh, there may be an exchange of ways of forming objects, methodologies, ways of situating the speaker with respect to the statement and so on, between different disciplines and discourses. And this will be important, I think, for the conceptual critique that Foucault develops in connection with the cultivation of the self later. 
the conditions for the production of new statements are in this sense dispersed across dispersed <coughs> conditions, while also being entirely specific insofar as there are conditions for the production of this or that statement and for the formation of this or that discourse at this moment. And they're not, that is, conditions for the possibility of knowledge in general. Moreover, the historical character of the conditions arises because the statements they underpin serve in turn as partial conditions for the production of new statements. So the rules governing knowledge are regularities that can always be modified by statements produced on their basis. <coughs> and this is what I understand by Foucault's phrase a historical a priori, which he sets out, of course, in the archaeology of knowledge. As I've said, <coughs> me, the originality of Foucault's approach to the historical character of knowledge lies in the fact that, on the one hand, he avoids giving to transcendental forms or conditions, and he does not propose that the universal conditions have been somehow historicized. And on the other hand, he does not trace the conditions of knowledge back to empirical events, which would, if he were to do that, it would encourage a view of history as uh, a narrative sustained by a thread of cause and effect. That Foucault frees up this further dimension of that of historical a priori this further dimension or mode of analysis in archaeology is significant for thinking about the cultivation of the self and its relation to truth and to critique. And I want to go on now to explain why I think that's the case. However, before getting to that point, um, there's one more theoretical or methodological shift in Foucault's writing that we need to take into account. In the government of, of self and others, Foucault identifies two theoretical displacements that took place in his thinking. It's not the only place he mentions this, but he does it there. The first, he writes, consisted in a move from the development uh, of bodies of knowledge to the analysis of forms of veridiction. That's uh, his phrase. A, a move from the development of bodies of knowledge to the analysis of forms of veridiction. Describes a similar move from knowledge to truth in Du Gouvernement de Devignon, where he writes that his thinking shifted from concern with power knowledge to a concern with government by truth. In order to understand what is significant for Foucault in this move from knowledge to truth, it's helpful, I think, to look at his lectures on the will to know. Now, incidentally, this course, the lectures, publishes the lectures on the will to know. The course was given in 1970-1971. I think the date is interesting because it, it comes very shortly after the publication of the Archaeology of Knowledge, which appeared in 1969. And then before Discipline Punish and other texts have been appearing. It, become, it comes therefore well before the concentration on Greek thought and literature that he that he moves to later on in the, uh, in the, the, the late 1970s. So, uh, this course on the lectures was no situated much closer to the archaeology, well before he comes back to thinking about Greece, apparently. But uh, most of the course is, is about Greek thought. So it's interesting because it really shows that he's already thinking about this stuff right there, just at the time he's just finished just published the archaeology. In the first two lectures of that course, Lectures on the Will to Know, Foucault describes in more detail what is involved in this shift from knowledge to truth. Going back to Aristotle's observation that the desire to know is um, essential to being human, Foucault explains that Aristotle justifies this by grounding knowledge in the sensation and by making sensation the beginning of a continuous movement towards the highest form of knowledge. As a result, knowledge becomes, in effect, the cause of itself and desire, a movement towards the accomplishment of the essential condition of man. In other words, 
knowledge precedes and conditions the desire to know. As a final cause, precedes and conditions the movement towards it. Desire, as Foucault observes, is thereby made to belong to knowledge. And in his words, writing, he cannot want knowledge for something other than itself, since it is starting from knowledge that it wishes to know. If the inscription of desire is fundamentally a will to knowledge has shaped philosophy almost throughout its history, it takes on a particular form in modernity as far as because the subject itself is to be the ground uh, of knowledge. So very much as described in the order of things, knowledge is grounded in the subject, while knowledge of the subject is itself conditioned by the knowledge of desires and what is there grounded in the circle. However, Foucault goes on after presenting this uh, uh, outline of knowledge in Aristotle. Foucault goes on to describe how Nietzsche was the first to release desire and will from being yoked to knowledge in this way. And by doing so, Nietzsche opens up new possibilities, not least for thinking about the cultivation of the self. Now he does this, Foucault continues, by pointing to the hidden role played by truth as a mediating term in the relation between desire and knowledge. Put very schematically, so forgive me for putting it quite this bluntly, desire is desire for truth, and knowledge is of the truth. The truth as the mediating term is then excluded from the equation, and desire is presented simply as desire knowledge. Moreover, as a consequence of this exclusion, the subject of desire and the subject of knowledge can be treated as the same by virtue of the fact that their common uh, connection or relation to truth, which is concealed. Unraveling this knot, Nietzsche showed that the desire from which knowledge arises has no original or essential relation to knowledge uh, at all. The history of knowledge is therefore not the unfolding of an internal necessity. As Foucault writes, behind the subject who knows in the form of consciousness, there is the struggle of inst instincts, partial selves, violence, and desires. To discover the places from which knowledge emerges, it is problematic to use the term origin or foundation here, to discover the places from which knowledge emerges, one must therefore bring into view this tangle of instincts, partial selves, violence, and desires. But with this, Foucault knows, comes the risk. A risk that is familiar from Foucault's earlier description uh, of knowledge in the order of things. How is it possible, Foucault asks, to know this other side of knowledge. How is it possible to know knowledge outside of knowledge? If what we say is true, then surely we must speak from within knowledge. If we speak outside of knowledge, then surely we cannot be sure that what we're saying is true. This, he writes, is the challenge presented by Kant. Kant, who at this point in the text, Foucault describes as a threat, a danger, the tiny daily peril, a trap, and even as a network of traps all appears within the space of a few lines. If thinking falls into this trap, critique will then strike against a limit it cannot surpass. And the bond between desire and knowledge will remain intact. And if it remains intact, the only path towards self cultivation is to know oneself. Indeed, to find oneself in the end, as knowledge is the condition of the desire and so precedes it. To avoid this, Foucault writes, truth must emerge as a term distinct from knowledge. And this is what he finds in Nietzsche. Only if truth is not simply that which is given to knowledge, does not necessarily have a common sight with knowledge, and does not belong to knowledge, will it be possible to access the 
other side of knowledge, and thereby establish a form of critique that is no longer bound by the horizon of modernity that he described the order of things. Moreover, once desire is no longer set from the first on the path towards knowledge, there is new scope for thinking about the cultivation of the self. Cultivation need not be conceived uniquely in terms of growth and refinement of knowledge, or to put this another way, the self will be able to take up different kinds of relation to truth, rather than just a knowledge relation being completely dominant. How is this possible? Well, up to this point in his exposition, The term that Foucault has been using for knowledge is connaissance, which denotes the knowledge relation between a subject and an object. This he describes as a pure event, and the idea of purity will crop up again shortly. It's a pure event, he writes, at the surface of events of a different kind. The event in the second sense is a multiplicity, in his words, dispersed between institutions, laws, political victories and defeats, demands, behaviours, revolts, reactions. In terms, then, this is still within the lectures on the will to knowledge, in terms similar to those used in the archaeology of uh, knowledge, events once identified are then said to define the role of a type of discourse, domain of objects to which it refers, the type of statements to which it gives rise, and significantly, the discussion here, the quality of the person who must deliver it. So we can say that who I am will depend on the set of events that define the order in which I speak and act. And in contrast to knowledge as connaissance, Foucault introduces the idea of knowledge as a savoir, which he defines as the set of such events. Still, in the lectures on the will to knowledge, Foucault then proposes a form of history addressed to these events that do not belong to connaissance, a form of history which engages the outside of knowledge as connaissance, operating in the space opened by breaking the affiliation between desire and knowledge. It is in this space Savoir understood as a set of such events in their dispersion that Foucault situates truth as it exists outside of knowledge as common sense. So truth is not simply what I can know, and its conditions extend beyond those of representation, cognition, and certainty. For the subject to be in relation to truth is for it to stand in relation to the rules, regularities, that condition the production of statements in ways that extend beyond the narrowly epistemological to include social, political, and institutional forms. Now, from this, I think we can draw the following conclusions, provisional conclusions, such so as pausing for breath here a bit, taking stock, what have we got? First, the analyses of Greek philosophy and literature that Foucault undertakes in the late 1970s into the 1980s, I would say belong within, but certainly have a strong connection to this uh, space opened up in the archaeology of knowledge back in the late 1960s. Second, this makes it possible, this makes possible the analysis of desire as not guided from the beginning of knowledge, its goal and precondition, and this opens to view relations to truth that are irreducible to knowledge as kind of science. In turn, this makes possible the renewal of critique, that is, critical practice addressed to the outside of knowledge. At least in principle, as it, uh, as to say, this makes possible, I say, this kind of critical practice addressed to the outside of knowledge. <coughs> this seems to be the case, but what that involves, we've yet to, we've yet to, uh, we've yet to see. Next point, Foucault's analyses of Greek thought are at least consistent 
with this renewal of critical thought insofar as they fall broadly within the response that formulates to the predicament of thought and modernity as Kant. Uh, a response that depends precisely on breaking the affiliation of knowledge as consoles and the desire to open up the possibility of different relations to truth. And then finally, it therefore now becomes possible to think about the cultivation of the self otherwise than as an ascent towards knowledge or wisdom. As we shall see, this does not involve the self negating with empirical events, simply by changing its conditions of its existence in an immediate sense, or simply by acquiring new knowledge, new knowledge or skills. Instead, the cultivation of the self will involve relating to the rules that condition knowledge, that is, by relating to events as they occur within the field of savoir. The cultivation of the self as Foucault intends it, therefore depends on such rules being neither simply empirical, nor transcendental, nor simply a historicized form of the transcendental. Once again, it was precisely this that Foucault demonstrated in the archaeology of knowledge, where the rules as regularities uh, are understood uh, as regularities in the configuration of discursive practices. So for this set of reasons, I think we can trace the link between the cultivation of the self and the renewal of critique after Nietzsche. Okay. Next part. Now I'll go on in a few moments to look at the, we're fairly briefly, between the, between the, uh, the connection between the cultivation of the self, truth-telling, and form of critical practice. But um, first I want to refer briefly to Foucault's analysis of the story of Oedipus in the Lectures on the Will to Know. I, I, I do this because it seems to me that it rounds out the political context of the analysis of knowledge and truth that Foucault presents earlier um, in the same course, and perhaps does so in a way that's helpful. Anyway, I hope so. As Foucault reads it, uh, the story is not primarily about desire, but rather about a system of constraints on the discourse of truth that societies in the West have continually reproduced ever since. So here's one of the occasions where he says, look, go back and read the Greeks and you find something which is actually a consistent structure which has been with us pretty much always. Uh, but since then. The constraint aligns knowledge with power, but on condition of the purity of the subject. So one can have power only on condition of having knowledge, and one can have knowledge only as long as one is pure. More specifically, the story of Oedipus announces a requirement to um, transform the event understood as dis dispersion of publicity into an observed fact. Uh, and I think we also see in Foucault's discussion of the Oedipus story kind of the cost of doing so. For the constraint ties truth back into the relation between desire and knowledge, and this kind of and thereby closes down the scope for a cultivation of the self through a wider engagement with truth. So in a way this story of Oedipus presents, as we can understand it, presents a kind of obstacle or challenge to the cultivation of the self. Um, I take it you're pretty familiar with the really, uh, story of uh, Oedipus, but um, when he was born, he was um, with a, the oracle that said that he was foretold his destiny, which you all know, to uh, give his father and marry his brother, and to avoid this, uh, he was given to a slave to be exposed on the other side to die. The slave um, couldn't bring himself to go through with it, passed uh, the, the baby to another slave in Corinth. Oedipus ends up growing up as the uh, son of Oedipus the king in Corinth, uh, thinking he's Oedipus his own son. Uh, later becomes aware of prophecy and thinks, I've got to avoid this, and so leaves Corinth and comes back to, comes back to Thebes. Uh, on the way he solved the riddle of the Sphinx and is adopted as the, uh, the ruler 
thieves. But of course, uh, all crucial information on the way, of course, is killed layers, because we spy on them. So, so things start happening uh, as, as we know. Now, so he's back in Thebes, uh, inadvertently participating in this prophecy coming true. When the gods grow tired of Oedipus prospering in spite of the impurity that comes from having murdered his father and married his mother, Thebes suffers from a series of afflictions, as the of disease and so forth, which the gods, let it be known, will stop only when the impurity within the city has been found and cast out. That is, who killed Laius? Oedipus vows to find out, and so begins his inquiry. Inevitably, this leads him to the realisation that he is himself the impurity, and that as a consequence, he must leave Thebes. Although the immediate reason for this is uh, clearly to satisfy the gods, beneath this one could also see a further reason that, as impure, indeed impure he is, Oedipus cannot have the knowledge of the law, the nomos, which it is judged he needs in order to rule. However, that judgment depends on the alignment of purity, knowledge, and power. Hold it, necessarily and without exception. But Foucault insists that this alignment between purity, knowledge, and power is established in, in his words, a fictitious place. It is fictitious because it involves reducing the dispersion of the event to a fact. Reducing nomos as an ensemble of regularities in the social order to an unchanging law. Reducing the savoir, in effect, to a renaissance. As a consequence, writes Foucault, this place can only fail to understand this having been produced historically and cannot see the political character of the processes that underlie it. This process then fails to see that the production of knowledge as a statement of fact rests on multiple relations between contingent events and the power circulates in these relations. On the contrary, once established, this alignment between purity, knowledge and power determines that only the pure can exercise power. The sage, the, the theologian, the scientist, and the philosopher, writes Foucault, can found the configuration of power and state its proper distribution, but, in his, in his words, only on the condition of not taking part in it and of remaining outside the actual exercise of power. Now we can see here the familiar model of the lawgiver, or the one who knows the law, as the one who stands apart, or of the true ruler, as the one who allows the law itself to govern through them. Nomos, the order of the world, is reduced to an unchanging law that can be possessed only by one who does not take part in the life it orders. The says that the emergent scientists occupy a place outside the distribution of contingent historic events, but the condition of this reduced to nomos. For Foucault, such a place is fictitious. The truth produced there that does all the work here. That is, the effects of this demarcation depend on the idea that a judgment of purity or impurity can be true or false, and that the distinction between the pure and the impure is a matter of fact. Now, I think the broader conclusions that can be drawn from this are as follows. One, the alignment to purity, truth, and power not only refuses to recognize the multiplicity of contingent events that are its hidden condition, in doing so it disqualifies anyone who is immersed in these events and their relations from speaking about the law. For such a person has not achieved the purity required to have knowledge of the law. This alignment therefore imposes silence on the one who has not already gained access to the status of lawgiver or law knower. Still more so, it will silence those who do not conform to the law, as they will be doubly impure. In this way, it acts as a severe constraint on permissible critique. 
This exclusion keeps out those who, through their actions and their position within the order of the world, have a direct relation to the law and its operation. Such people will have a relation to truth, for which there may be no expression in the law as recognized. The cultivation of the self cannot be understood as uniquely the growth and refinement of knowledge. Indeed, it need not be understood as an ascent out of the world of contingent relations and as a power in order to gain authority over it. Finally, in these list of conclusions, if this much is clear in a social and political sense, we'll have to see uh, it also remains the case when we look at the self in an ethics, in a more explicit ethical sense, in its relations to the self. Last half. I want to turn now, uh, perhaps belatedly, and uh, I'm afraid quite briefly, really, this is really the direction that it's all going, the theme of the conference and so forth, to this question between the truth telling and the cultivation of the self. Now, as you know, Foucault describes how historically the imperative to know oneself was in the service of the more fundamental practice of caring for oneself. Foucault's work in this area covers the teaching and practice of Socrates, the Cynics, the Stoics, Epicurus, and the early Christian. As a consequence, it's practically impossible, and probably a very, very bad idea, to generalize. However, <laughs> if I were to generalize, um, <coughs> Being out a common feature, at least, it would be that in each case to care for oneself involves working on the ways of acts, speaks, and relates both to others and to oneself. And to care for oneself is, in this sense, to engage in a form of practical relation to the self. A relation mediated by knowledge of some kind, codes, norms, and instructions, and which is generally carried out in the presence of others, and often with the direct assistance of an other. An important part of this practice, in all its forms, is that of truth-telling. And in particular, the notion of paresia, speaking openly or frankly. To practice paresia is, Foucault writes, to tell the truth as one sees it, without concealing anything. In addition, the one who speaks should do so in a way that she identifies herself with the truth she speaks. There's a phrase which I, was, I read and noted, and then made the novice's mistake of not noting exactly where I found it, and uh, couldn't find it later, but it's in there somewhere. I think it's in the government uh, itself and others, where talking about Paresia, uh, Foucault says, the one who speaks in this way makes a kind of commitment. I am the one who will have said, finds himself to speech in this way. Finally, and crucially, in speaking, the one who practices Paresia takes a risk of some kind. Really the crucial thing in many ways. The one who practices Paresia takes a risk of some kind that concerns her relation to the person to whom she is speaking. This risk may take different forms depending on the context of truth telling and whether we're dealing with Paresia in the context of politics or in the context of uh, the self's relation to the self or to a spiritual guide. Accordingly, it may expose the speaker to possible violence or even death, or where the truths are more intimately concerned with, the, with one's own actions, words and thoughts, uh, the risk may simply be that one is taken to task by the other, or that the relation between the speaker and the one spoken to is damaged. And I'll come back to these alternatives in a moment. The key thing here is that in speaking the truth, the one who practices paresia does not just speak the words, what is right or wrong to say, 
how it is right or wrong to speak, are defined by rules that reach beyond the immediate situation in which the act takes place. A very simple example, I think, would be how students at school, speak of teachers, is determined by a complex set of rules which reach in many directions, and not simply by a table of regulations that are just drawn up by the head teacher. In speaking, the one who practices Palaisia takes up a relation to these rules in this wider sense, and not in the narrowest, not in, just in the narrow sense of the situation uh, immediately in front of the one speaking. And does so in such a way uh, that, as a speaker, one demonstrates one's non-conformity. And in doing so, one leaves oneself exposed in some way. Nowhere is this more evident in the analysis that Foucault gives than in the lecture course given in 1983 at Four, The Courage of Truth, where he takes up the theme of Parasia in relation to the cynics. Uh, although known uh, for displays of insolence and rudeness and for a disregard of social norms, the truth that the, the, truth that the cynics tell, Foucault says, in their actions and their words, is in a real sense the truth of the life as it is led by others. The rules of this life are made manifest precisely by the extreme actions of the cynic and are then put in, thereby put in question. So the true life here is defined not by its conformity to the essence of life. True life of the cynic is, is defined not by its conformity to the essence of life or of humanity, a life bound to that essence by unchanging laws. It is a life that is conducted openly without an attempt to conceal itself or to remain invisible. In the cynic practice of Parasia, writes Foucault, one risks one's life, not just by telling the truth and in order to tell it, but by the very way in which one lives. As Frederick Groth puts it in the course context that follows the lecture course itself, the cynics track down the elementary in the undergrowth of conventions and social artifacts, and by asking for what is true in each desire, in each need, the cynic Palatio produces a scouring of existence as a result of which our lives appear overburdened with contingencies and futile vanities. So the cynic's whole life becomes a manifestation of another way of living. In a very different situation, the stoic practice of self-examination, the truth to be told is the truth of one's own everyday thoughts and actions. Here, the aim is less the exposure of the lives of others, the more the shaping of one's own. It takes place through the open and frank disclosures and guidance exchanged between the individual and his guide, master or friend. And in this way, one who speaks openly, however, is still exposed as a result, but this time by virtue of laying open his life for inspection. For example, Foucault discusses the relations between Marcus Aurelius and Fronto, between Lucius and Seneca, when the individual's relation to himself is mediated by another whose task, or one of whose tasks at least, is to make explicit where and how the one who wishes to cultivate himself must modify his conduct. And that deserves a whole study of so many studies. So, much so I really say about it here, except just to add that um, the fact of a break with norms and expectations is so important. As far as the one aiming to cultivate the self here must leave a previous set of norms and expectations and take on new ones, or must modify a previous set of norms and expectations in order to take up something distinct. It may be a marked change, quite dramatic in some cases, or it may simply be a more modest change in, uh, in, in others. In every case, however, there is still a kind of risk involved in this 
which arises from uh, what Foucault describes simply as a challenge to the bond of the two interlocutors. And that could be understood in a variety of ways, of course, about what kind of bond. truth-telling in these uh, different forms sketched very briefly here, or too briefly, I know. Foucault's, Foucault's accounts of truth-telling in these different forms can be taken as examples of a certain kind. Here we come back to the question, how are we supposed to read these texts? What do we take from them? The reader's account of Seneca, the reader's account of Peter and the cynics of it. Very interesting. What do we do with this? How do we read it? Well, let's say we take, take them as examples of a certain kind. But of what kind? As I said at the beginning, the point is not that we convert to some kind of neo stoicism or that we literally take up these arms and cynics. Nor, I would add, is it that we just simply recognise there is value in engaging in the practice of self-examination per se. That's too weak. I think that Foucault's work on ancient Greek and Roman thought can be read as a resource for thinking about the ways in which the self lives in relation to truth, such that self-cultivation and critique are combined. And combined in a way that speaks directly to the difficult situation that Foucault described in the order of to the extent that this is true, Foucault's work on ancient Greek and Roman thought stands indeed within the space open by his thought in the late 1960s. Now, more precisely, let me suggest just a uh, very few points of further points of conclusion. To cultivate the self involves taking up a position with respect to truths embedded in the lives we lead, truths that lie in the rules that shape our conduct, individually and collectively. These rules may take the form of norms as we are accustomed to think of them, but this is not the only form that they take, and arguably not the most important. They are also, they might also be understood as regularities that condition statements of fact, thinking back to this reduction of events to facts that Foucault identified in the story of um, Oedipus. They are also regularities that condition the statements of fact which influence the way we live. For example, the facts presented as underpinning the politics of austerity. Such regularities can be traced back through multiple precedents and contingent circumstances that stretch beyond the specific field in which the fact itself appears to be lodged, which are the political economy. And the methodology for this kind of inquiry, or at least our methodology for this kind of inquiry, is of course archaeology. Now this can be understood as a form of critique insofar as it shows that there, is, that there is a contingent basis for what presents itself as in some sense necessary or universal. Remember, this is the kind of sense of critique that Foucault talks about in the, the uh, text what is enlightenment. But it is a form of critique that cannot be conducted solely at the level of the dispute over which rules are true or right, as if this could be no objective. Given what Foucault tells us in the archaeology of knowledge about the historical traditions of knowledge, statements require, statements require speakers and recipients, those who hear the statement on the receiving end of them, to occupy well-defined positions with respect to institutional forms, customs and practices and so forth. To practice critique therefore requires placing oneself openly in a problematic relation to those social and historical forms which make facts knowable no, no, in any case. As a consequence, one's subjectivity 
is at stake, not just what one thinks about this or that issue. This here is an engagement with truth that I think he finds in ancient Greek and Roman thought. Even though he does not, for the most part, use the terminology of networks and discursive formations and so forth. The practices of truth-telling that Foucault presents can therefore be seen as examples of the engagement with truth that he envisaged back in the late 60s and early 1970s as having been made possible by Nietzsche breaking the affiliation between desire and knowledge. There are examples of critique practiced on what lies outside knowledge and thereby a form of critique that belongs distinctively now in some way. That's really my main, that's the point of what I want to propose. Finally, what, exactly what form such critical practices may take, uh, or indeed are taking in, in our own day, is a whole other question. But if Foucault is right, they will involve placing oneself openly at odds with accepted ways of thinking and speaking and acting through conscious engagement with the regularities that shape these accepted ways of thinking, speaking, and acting, and the facts that stand over them as principles of ordering. These regularities will, as I've mentioned already, stretch and ramify from one discipline and field to another, so that in order to engage in a particular kind of, to, to engage in critique, in this sense, one has not only to be prepared to be uh, exposed uh, rather than simply pronouncing a judgment, writing something, speaking something, um, but one has to be prepared to follow uh, the kind of tracks of this critique into different areas so that it's not uh, focused on a particular discipline. Um, so it seems to me that those might be two characteristics that you can look for in the um, practice of this kind of critique. I shall leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention.